Hi and welcome to another Microbiology Basics. In this video, I want to take a look at the basics of bacterial meningitis. So welcome back. In this video, I want to talk about bacterial meningitis. Now the original plan was to cover all of the bacterial meningitis in one video, but as I was putting it together, I noticed it was getting kind of long. And so what we're going to do in this one is we're going to cover the basics, what it is, what it impacts, what's the treatment. In the other videos, we're going to take a look at the three big culprits separately that cause the bacterial meningitis. So let's get going with this one. First, let's understand what itis means because we're talking about meningitis, itis. What is itis? Itis means inflammation of. So anytime you see the itis at the end of a word, it means something's inflamed. So for example, bronchitis. Bronchitis means inflammation of the bronchial tubes. Bursitis, this is inflammation of the bursas. It's a little fluid-filled sac. Arthritis, I'm sure you've heard of arthritis before. That's an inflammation of the joints. And of course, what we're talking about in this video is meningitis, inflammation of the meninges. Now, before we get into what the meninges are or what all this stuff is let's understand an orange wait an orange wait. yes an orange or grapefruit your choice but if you were to unpeel an orange you would see the pulp the meat of the orange and it's just not one big blob of orange inside you take off the outer skin and you can separate out segments of the orange well, the brain is kind of like this. The orange has the pulps, the, the meat wrapped individually by membranes. It's segmented by the membranes. Well, the brain has membranes too. If you were to open up the skull, which really is cool by the way, um, if you were to open up the skull of a human or, or any other animal, you would notice that the brain is just not a bleh brain. It's just not a big blob of stuff. You have... Uh, membranes wrapping around the brain, segmenting off different parts of the brain. Now, all the brain is connected, but you get you, you have the things that go inside, the grooves, the, the, the fissures, all that fun stuff. So it's wrapped within these membranes, and the membranes of the brain are called meninges. And meninges help support and separate portions of the brain. Now, there are three types of meninges you need to be aware of. And we're not going to go into this in too much detail because this is not a video on the nervous system. By the way, if you're interested in those, I do have those on my channel, YouTube, uh, Mr. Ford's class. So be sure to subscribe and check those out. But just really quickly, we have three types of meninges in the brain. We have the dura mater, which is the tough mother. We have the arachnoid matter, which is spiders. And then we have the pia mater, which is the tender mother. And you can see from the graphic where these are located. So we're going from external, most external things going in. So we have the outermost layers going in. And again, if you ever do a um, dissection of a human or other animals, the dura mater is this kind of thick bag, okay? So from the CDC, the basics of meninges. Meningitis, or I should say meningitis, basis meningitis. From the CDC, meningitis is a disease caused by the inflammation of the protective membranes covering the brain and spinal cord known as the meninges. Hey, we just talked about that. The inflammation is usually caused by an infection of the fluid surrounding the brain and spinal cord. Of course, the fluid is the CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. And again, we're not going to get into that in this video. If you're interested, I have an entire video series on the nervous system. So the initial symptoms of meningitis, and this is important. If you are going into the healthcare profession, meningitis kills. And you have a very short time, by the way, once this stuff hits, to get treatment. In fact, it's so rapidly progressing that treatment will begin before we actually have the lab results. So the minute it's, suspect, it's uh, uh, suspected as a cause, boom, they're doing the treatments because they don't want somebody dead in their hands, all right? So the initial symptoms are fever. So the person will have fever and chills. They will have a killer headache. The headache occurs in most people with meningitis, and it is, it's not just a mild headache. It's not just like, ooh, mm, it's, it's, woo, it's right there. It's a headache. And of course, probably the most well-known symptom of meningitis is that stiff neck. 
In fact, if you, um, I'm going to put links on this, by the way, uh, Brudinsky's sign. Brudinsky's sign, you might also hear it called Brudinsky's neck sign or Brudinsky's symptoms. What happens here is the patient lays face upward. So they're laying on their back. This is called supine. And they're going to get their neck flexed. So a medical practitioner is going to flex their neck. And as their neck is being flexed, the knees and the hips pull up. And obviously, I'm kind of showing you a little bit about what this is. But again, I'm going to have links in the description where you can actually see people doing this test. And if those knees and hips pull up, that is considered a positive sign. So there's other symptoms that go along with meningitis. For example, nausea, you feel like you're going to throw up, and throwing up, vomiting. You also can have something called photophobia. Phobia means fear of, photo being light. So they have a fear of light. So for example, it's pretty bright in here. They would be, it would just, it would hurt. Um, anybody who suffers migraines, you probably know what I'm talking about. Photophobia is a common uh, uh, symptom within migraines. And then we have some really, really serious symptoms. We can have convulsions. The person can um, start having seizures. We can have coma. We can have confusion. So these are the things you don't want to get to. You want to have treatment before that hits. So what causes meningitis? Because meningitis is just not one disease. Meningitis is a disease caused by other factors. So what are these factors? What are these things? What are these causative agents that cause meningitis? Well, there are several, and there are several different families of it. For example, you can have viral meningitis, meningitis caused by a virus. You can have bacterial, which is the focus of this little series. You can have fungal, and you can have parasitic. Basically, remember, meningitis is any inflammation of the meninges. So we have to look at what's causing that. From the CDC, we have a little table here of common causative agents by age group. So bacterial meningitis, about 70% of the cases of bacterial meningitis are caused by these three culprits right here. Now, that's not all, all the causes. There's about 50 different species, 50 different species of bacteria that can cause meningitis. But these only account for 30% of the cases of the meningitis. But these three guys are the most um, common causes of the bacterial meningitis. And we're gonna have videos on all three of these separate. So we're gonna go into those in more detail. Risk factors. Whenever you look at a disease, you have to look at the risk factors. What is the most common um, situation? What are the most common uh, factors that come together to make somebody more susceptible to something? So the first one is age. It's always age with, with diseases. Um, age, infants are at higher risk, aren't they always? And um, of course, people at any age can be at risk for meningitis. Community settings. Community settings, you'll find that meningitis, bacterial meningitis, is a person-to-person -person kind of a thing. So if you have people close together, this can spread. If That might be why if you are a freshman in college or you might remember that you had to sign a bacterial meningitis waiver or you had to get vaccinated, this is why, because meningitis can spread within a community setting. And if you ever have an outbreak of meningitis or you have one person that comes down with bacterial meningitis, there's usually this big panic on campus where people will get tested and they'll say, okay, if you get a headache, you know, you need to report it and all that stuff. So community setting infectious diseases tend to spread more quickly when larger groups of people gather together, college students in resident hall, and of course, military personnel, because again, they're pretty close together. And this is specifically the meningococcal meningitis, as far as um, the one that you probably had to sign waivers for. Certain medical conditions, there are certain diseases, medications, and surgical procedures that may weaken the immune system uh, or increase risk of meningitis in other ways. The last two risk factors are, this is kind of a no kidding, the one. Obviously, if you're working with people who have meningitis, you are more at risk. Or if you're working with bacteria, the previous three that can cause bacteria or meningitis, then again, you are at higher risk. And travel. Travelers to men the meningitis belt in sub-Sahara Africa, and we'll take a look at that in a separate video. There's actually this band across the world where meningitis is a lot more common than the rest of the world. And so that would be the meningit meningitis belt that you have to be careful of. Um, also at risk for meningococcal meningitis are travelers to Mecca, 
during those religious holidays. Again, if you think about it, community settings, you have a whole bunch of people together, and so it can tr it can um, jump from person to person. So how is it diagnosed? Now remember, if a doctor suspects you have bacterial meningitis, they're doing the treatment before they even get the lab results back because it it's about 24 hours. So this thing hits, boom, and it's very rapid. So bacterial meningitis can be deadly and progress rapidly. Typical treatments, chemotherapy. Now chemotherapy, you're thinking chemotherapy, cancer. No, no, no. Chemotherapy is treatment with drugs, okay? So chemotherapy is initiated before an official diagnosis is given to diagnose Properly, you need to get a spinal tap, turn it to 11, and um, you get a little bit of cerebral spinal fluid and you test that. So treatment, we're talking about bacterial here. So when you're talking about bacteria, you're usually talking about antibiotics. So you can treat effectively with antibiotics. Important that treatment be started as soon as possible. If you've seen my video on a bubonic plague on Yersinia pestis, then you know that with all these bacterial diseases that are this deadly, Early treatment is the key for um, survival. Appropriate antibiotic treatment should reduce the risk of dying to below 15%. Risk still remains high among young infants and, of course, the elderly because they're just more um, susceptible. They're more prone to this stuff happening. Okie dokie. So that's going to conclude our quick look at bacterial meningitis. In our other videos in this series, we're going to take a look at each of the three bacteria that are known to cause this. So until then, click that subscribe button. Be sure to like it if you learned something. And good luck studying out there. Goodbye for now.